Hosting for the Dice Tower is generously provided by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Thanks for your support. The Dice Tower, episode 451. Very, 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 very long game. Welcome to the Dice Tower, a podcast about board games and card games, and especially the people who play them. On today's show, we answer questions from the mailbag, including how to contact companies who won't pay attention to you, and a discussion on the costs of card quality. Plus, we settle in for the long haul with our top ten long games. I'm Eric Summerer, and here's your host, the Cecil B. DeMille of board gaming, Tim, I mean, Tom. Vassal. Okay, now you're really stretching here. Well, DeMille was known for the big epics, and that's what we're talking about. Long games. Yeah, but how many people know that? Oh, lots of people know that. I didn't know it. Okay. But that's okay. I'm sure someone else knew it. Yeah, yeah, probably. Well, anyway, folks, welcome to the Dice Tower. My name's Tom Vassal. Hi there. I'm Eric Summerer. So, wow. Wow. Is it? This has been a week of, like, trying to get back to normal. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've been fighting off the cold, which is no fun. Yes, but I, I do enjoy how you blame that cold on ConCon and not on, on Gamma. I was fine when I got back from Vegas, and then I went to ConCon, and everybody at ConCon got sick. Mm. No fun. And my son didn't even get to come because he was sick. Everybody was sick. So he didn't get to come and do the, the convention with me, which bummed me out. I think this is partially because of your weather there. Could be. Every time the seasons change. It's interesting. When people get sick at conventions, then I always see them swearing online that they're going to carry around uh, hand sanitizer. They're not going to shake people's hands and yada, yada. And yet, right. I don't see people really following up on that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, everybody, we keep trying to make the fist bump the... Uh... Uh, I'm sorry. What? We... Well, the, the... A lot of people will go around fist bumping. No, there's not a lot like, of people. It is the administration of BGG and Richard Ham. Almost okay. everyone else shakes hands. Not a lot of people, like five okay. out of hundreds. Well, but those five people are really trying to make it work. They are, and I'm fighting against it because handshaking, I don't think a fist bump saves any more germs than handshaking does. Most people don't wash their outside of their hands very well. So how is fist bumping any better? Um, because you usually don't eat with the outside of your hands? Yes, I understand that. But dirt gets on the outside of your hands just as easily. And just like food falling on the floor only needs a fraction of a second to actually pick up dirt and germs, the same thing. If you fist bump someone's hand, it doesn't matter that it's a less intimate contact. I'm so just really, we just need to be sanitizing hands more often. That's really what needs to be done. I, because the thing about the fist bump is it makes everything super awkward because you go up and you fist bump someone and they're like, oh, uh, and they get ready to shake your hands and you have to have a short conversation about why you fist bump. And, right. And then you're trying to convert them into something that no one really wants to do anyway because it's been ingrained in our head that we shake hands when we meet people. And yes, Richard told me he's planning to start a revolution on this. Uh, but I believe he told me that two years ago and there's still five people doing it. Which means, of course, Eric, you know that we're going to get emails from people saying, we do it too. Of course. Of course. But my empirical evidence has been very few people still do it. I, sure. I really should ask a doctor. You. you know, I think a doctor, if any, if any of our listeners are a doctor, that's something I'd actually like to know. Does not shaking people's hands really stop you from getting sick? Is is that really a factor? I'm sure it has to do with something. I'm wondering. Hmm. Because when when you uh you know when the the different foods were going around, they didn't say don't shake people's hands. They just said use sanitizer. Right. Also, cough into your elbow. Okay. Thanks for listening to the Dice Tower, MD. <laughs> this has been our medical show.
I wonder if Dr. Oz plays board games. I'll tell you what. I'm just trying to fight against this whole talking about getting sick stuff. When I'm with a friend and we're ta- sitting there and they're like talking about their knee and we talk about it for a while, I'm like, wait, stop. We are not old. <laughs> we yeah. will not talk about our ailments and illnesses to the boredom. It does of seem like I don't bounce back as quickly as I used to. Well, we are getting older. I know. Okay, but let's talk about things that are fun and interesting and that – sorry for the listeners. We've already lost. But we have some <laughs> games that we have played recently. Eric has there played one a few. that I got in the mail, but I did not uh, play it yet. But it looks cool. I hope it is. Ah, well, that would be Valeria Card Kingdoms. And this is a uh, card drafting game, uh, much along the lines of Machi Koro. It's a fantasy theme, and uh, you've got all these different, you know, fighters and paladins and all this stuff that are put out in an array, and um, it's a random setup at the beginning of each game. There are also five different varieties of bad guys that are arranged in in, uh, stacks at the top of the board uh, on the table, and... um, They're arranged from weakest to strongest. So there's like five of them in the stack. And you'll get a couple of dinky guys and then one really strong one and then a super deluxe big boss. Uh, So those are arranged at the top. Then you've got some random citizen cards, uh, two rows of those, I think 10 for each setup. In fact, it's definitely 10 because you want to have one for each die result. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And then there's there's a nine slash 10 and an 11-12 card. Uh, and then there's also sort of victory cards that are... Um, they're, they're, they're called location. They're not locations. They're domains. That's what they're called. And they, um, they will give you a bunch of points and maybe some sort of ability for the rest of the game or some sort of instant reward. Uh, and uh, you're, you're trying to draft those. But you need to have certain symbols in your tableau in order to, uh, to acquire those cards, those victory cards. What you do on your turn is you're going to roll these two dice. And everyone is going to score their cards in front of them based on what you rolled. But unlike Machi Koro, where you simply add the two die together to to form one result, you will score and activate not only the addition of the two dice, but also each individual die. So I roll a two, a four. I will activate all of my twos, all of my fours, and all of my sixes which speeds things up quite a bit. Also, on any turn, if you did not activate any of your guys in front of you, you get a free resource. So it speeds things up a lot more than Machi Koro, where you you are constantly getting resources. In a four-player game, you're bound to get at least three more resources by the time it gets back to you. Uh, There's two resources, or three resources. There's fighting power, which you use to defeat the bad guys. There's gold, which you use to purchase cards and achieve those domains. And then there's magic, which is sort of a wild that can be used to augment either fighting or gold. Uh, But you at least need to have one standard gold or one standard fighting when you spend it. So you go around the table, roll the dice, activate your guys. Oh, and each of these cards also has an ability that it has one effect when it's your turn. And it has a different effect when it's somebody else's turn. Uh, Usually more powerful when it's on your turn. And you, you continue collecting resources, purchasing cards, until either all of the bad guys are gone, all of the domains are gone, or a certain number of uh, the, the citizen cards are gone based on the number of players. So, is it fun? Yes. I, I enjoyed it. Um, I, I like that it ramps up more quickly. It's more fun to collect all these resources. Although one of the players at the table sort of said, maybe this economy is a little too loose. Like, by the time it gets back to you, you're bound to be able to do something. Um, and, and whether that's a good thing or not, it, it's hard to say. I think um, maybe different assortments of cards might, uh, might change that. But in the couple games we played, there was a lot of resources at the table, which I enjoyed. I liked having lots of stuff to spend and make epic things happen. Um, but if you want that more tight economy from Machi Koro, this loosens it up quite a bit. I did enjoy it, though. Thumbs up for Valeria Card Kingdoms. Oh, hey, future Eric here. And yes, thank you, I'm feeling much better. I don't usually like to amend my reviews uh, after I've talked with Tom, but one element that I had intended to talk about, and I didn't get a chance to uh, in the conversation, was the card quality 
of Valeria. And and this is the one, you know, niggly bit uh, about my review, and it's that almost immediately after unpacking this game, the first time I took it out, the cards started to curl pretty significantly. Uh, this isn't a huge deal because you're not really shuffling these cards. You're drafting them into a tableau in front of you. But it does mean they don't sit flat on the table. They sort of spin around a little bit. It's not a huge deal, but it is something I wanted to note in the review because I am so positive on the game. It doesn't bother me, but if it if that sort of thing does bother you, you should be aware that the, the card quality doesn't seem to be quite as high as other games. Just Just so you know. Back to Bast, Eric and Tom. Hmm. Hmm. Well, after we went to the Gamma Trade Show last week, and you heard us talk about that a little bit, well, mostly Eric, in our last episode, I went to MeepleCon. MeepleCon. Uh-huh. Eric and I both went to extra conventions. Eric to ConCon, I mean a MeepleCon. Yes. MeepleCon, I learned a couple things there. First of all, that we should have been traveling – off the strip for the entirety of our Las Vegas convention. Eh. Because, wow, were things cheaper. Oh, yeah. It was enlightening, Eric. Really? I had a hamburger that was bigger than my head for $10. Wow. And then they gave me a certificate when I ate it all. That's... Which Sam yeah. and Z have not stopped talking about. Have you framed it? Is it hanging in the office? They want to frame it. I don't know what the deal is. I mean, I, I mean, I wasn't going to not take the certificate. Just like once I found out that you got one, I wasn't going to not finish it. I didn't realize it was going to be that big when I ordered it. I just assumed yeah. that it, it said one pound burger, and I didn't think one pound was that big. But um, but it is. And yeah, the, it's pretty big. And they put, I think, like a whole onion and tomato on It was ridiculous. So... Anyhow, um, before people say, yeah, I'm going to be on my diet, I'm, I'm down another – I have not gained any weight because we were walking like 10 miles a day. And I have since lost two more pounds since last week. So I'm good. But it was just an interesting thing. Secondly, I, I learned that Uber is amazing. Why do we not Uber everywhere? Why do we even use taxis? Uh, well. I, it just, it's just awesomeness. And thirdly, uh, that MeepleCon is a great convention. Took me a while to swing back the board games there. But you know how food distracts me. Yes. So anyhow, MeepleCon, a convention in Las Vegas. This is a small convention, uh, smallish. I'd say there's like 400 people there or so. And they, it, it, it looked very similar to Dice Tower Con 2, Eric. Okay. They had a library, which was a smallish library, maybe a couple hundred games, but they were all good games. So, for example, I, if you had to ask me pick this library or the Gen Con library, I would pick this library. Okay, and I got to play lots of great games, uh, lots of uh, fun games. I, I played a lot of games that I already know how to play. I even played Vegas Showdown because I thought that would be kind of meta hmm. to play it in in a place. They had a free arcade room where you could go play like uh, Street Fighter Two and the Terminator oh, game where you shoot the guns for free. Nice. And when you died, you just pressed the button and kept going, and that was entertaining. So it was just a whole That's lot of cool. fun. But anyhow. When I was there, I played World's Fair 1893. This is a new game from Renegade Games. It has a board that looks like a Ferris wheel to some degree. And on your turn, you are like doing area control. So you get to place a cube on any section on this board. When you do so, you'll take all the cards that are on that board. You will then add one more card to the board that you took the cards from and then two more cards to the next two boards. So these boards are constantly increasing in cards, and you're like, oh, man, that one has five cards. But this one only has one card, but I really want to control that one. The Mm. cards are going to do different things. Some will let you put out more cubes on your next turn. Some will give you straight victory points. They're tickets. Those cards also rotate the Ferris wheel to make the game end. And other cards are different colors, and at the end of each scoring round, if you have the most in an area, you can change the cards you've gotten for that area into tokens, and tokens score you points, cards do not. It was very simple, flowed very well. I was very impressed with this one. It's a it's a nice 
gateway style game. I taught it to some people who hadn't played many games before. and They were easily able to jump in, but I thought there was some good depth to it too. So, and it looks really cool. Renegade just keeps Renegade is kind of cementing themselves in that lightweight Euro game category. Hmm. Uh, I mean, if you look at their games, you know, their Lanterns is probably their most well known at this point. Yeah. And they got um, well, Snow Tails. No, Snow Tails and. So they have these games that are coming out in that genre, and I think I think that's a kind of a cool thing. It, it, it gives them kind of a focus, and it's a good focus. I mean, when they first split off from Cryptozoic, we just thought, well, it will be Cryptozoic Part 2. Mm-hmm. But it's not. No, they're definitely differentiating themselves. Very much so, and it's kind of cool. So anyway, that's World's Fair 1893. Next up for me is Lattice, I which a lot is of spelled Lattice this week. L A T I C E, that, oh. that, just to differentiate themselves. Um, I, I've been wanting to play this one for a while, but as soon as I opened it up, uh, it, it's a tile laying game, and um, one of the tiles, a purple dolphin, was misprinted. It on the back side, it had another symbol on it, and I wrote to the company and said, "Hey, uh, the, you you misprinted a tile," and they said, "No problem. We're going to send you a replacement purple dolphin," and they sent me in the mail a purple turtle tile and i said thanks for the purple turtle i need a purple dolphin and they said no problem we'll send you a purple dolphin and so a couple days later half of an envelope arrived at my house with no tile and i said thanks for the envelope (laughs) and they said we'll send you a purple dolphin and finally a purple (laughs) dolphin arrived so So, we finally got this to the table uh lattice is a lot like quirkle but um quirkle is a little more rigid in the way that you're allowed to play tiles Uh, There are six different symbols and six different colors, uh, and you are trying to get rid of all of your tiles. You split them up at the beginning of the game, and you will have drawn five from your personal stock that you can actually do something with. You will place them on the board so that they match, either in color or in symbol, or both, all of the tiles that you lay them next to. Uh, If you're able to lay something next to two tiles, then you get... Like half of a moonstone, there are little little blue moonstones and large yellow moonstones. Half of a moonstone can be combined with another half to take another turn. If you manage to connect to three tiles, you get a full moonstone. And if you manage to get to four, you get two moonstones. There's also some moonstones on the uh, the, the table, on, the, on the, the board. And if you place on those spaces, they're actually called sunstones. Uh, You get a sunstone um, if you place on those spaces as well. And you can use those to take extra turns. There are also wind tiles. And you can use these to slide one tile one space. Uh, And you can sort of break the placement rules when you do that. So you can open up spaces for you to place things that you want to place. And then you get to play an immediate tile after that. So the wind tiles are very powerful. And as such, I wholeheartedly recommend that you play with a variant in the rulebook that splits up those wind tiles evenly amongst all the players. You, you just split them up evenly, then add the rest of the tiles in, mm. split those up evenly, and those are now your personal stock. Because if one player, the first time we played, one player got more of those wind tiles than anybody else, and that opens up your possibilities significantly, um, and they, they ran away with the game. Splitting it up made it a little more even. I mean, you, you don't know when you're going to get those wind tiles into your hand, but still, you know they're coming, which is good. Um, I liked it. Uh, at first, I didn't think I would. I thought it seemed a little too open. But as the game progresses and the, and the board fills up, it's harder to find a place to play your stuff. And you have to, um, you have to be a little more careful about what opportunities you leave open for you to play your few remaining tiles. Um, I liked it. Uh, it, it's good as a family game. It can certainly be taught to the younger kids. Um, not too young, but I could certainly play this with my eight-year-old. But it's, it's fun for the adults as well. It's a good, solid family game. And if you like those tile-laying games similar to Quirkle, well, this is certainly similar to Quirkle. I liked Lattice. I like Lattice. I'm glad. And now... Let's get dark. Oh, I, I know what's coming. Yes, because I had to talk to Eric personally about this because I could not believe that Eric had been so very wrong on our show. I often accuse Eric of being wrong on this show, but I usually do it with tongue in cheek. But this time, mm-hmm. he was maliciously wrong. Maliciously? Yeah, well, you promoted a game which should not be promoted by anybody. 
<sighs> and that game is Epic Roll. Now, I already did my hmm. rant on why Epic shouldn't be in the title. And I will say that a good 30% of my extreme dislike for this game comes from the fact that they put the word epic in when the game is actually the very opposite of epic. It's dirt simple, yes. Problem one. There's a theme in this game about dungeons, but you could literally remove that theme and with one exception of the hit points of each person, that theme doesn't mean anything. What's the difference between a skeleton and a mummy? Almost nothing. Hit points. The game is pure luck. It is literally roll the dice and see what happens. There are different characters. They have different dice that they roll. What does that mean? It means they roll different dice. It doesn't mean anything. Yeah, one guy blocks more hits and and another guy does more damage. But in the long run... That doesn't mean anything. It's also horrible quality. All right. So we have a horrible quality game with a very boring, super bland, lazy, but generic fantasy trash placed on a game where your only decision is roll again or don't roll again. And you have nothing to base that on other than I think I'll roll well this turn. Because you de- there's there's nothing. There's no modifiers. There is nothing. Well, there are the cards you can spend. Yes, but you get the cards by rolling well. So you might as well just keep rolling. There's no reason in this game to ever stop. You just Well, if you want to save your progress, yes. But then the other person goes and you're bored. So well, you might as okay. well just keep rolling your shirt. There's, there's nothing. There is not one thing about this game that I liked. I didn't like the box. I didn't like the art. I didn't like the theme. I didn't like the game. I want to go stop on this game right now, but I haven't done my video review of it yet. I have not disliked the game this much in 2016, period. Wow. This is my most hated game of 2016. But I, I'm, I, I, I understand your arguments. I just don't understand the vitriol. I, I mean, it's it's a dirt simple game. It's along the lines of Skunk. It's a very simple push your luck, roll, keep no, no, going no, listen, or not. Listen, sort no. of game. Going, um, what's the what's the um, what's Bruno Fadu's game? Um, Alan Moon. Uh, blah 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 blah. My mind's going blank. Where you go into the into the temple, Ink and Gold. Ink and Gold. Ink and Gold is a very simple game, but you can see. Which monsters have come out? Okay, there's two snakes out. There's a good chance a third snake is going to appear. Or, no, we already took one of the snakes out of the deck, so snakes aren't as dangerous. There's this much treasure. If I leave now, I'm going to get this much treasure. The risk-reward is there. When I play Ink and Gold, I almost never run out of the the temple. But that's a silly decision on my part. The game Mm. actually has a realistic decisions to make. That is dirt simple. And yet it's a good game. This is as if the designers played Ink and Gold and said, how can we make it worse? (laughs) Folks, I am not saying this game is not for me. I'm saying this game's not for anyone whose last name isn't Summer. Wow. Yeah, well, you like it, so I have to give it to you. But I'm... I I said for for an extremely light Push Your Luck game, I enjoyed it. No. Awful. Awful. All right. Okay, negativity off. I'm back. I like the next game. I'll talk about it in a bit. Uh, okay, you haven't played this one, though, that I'm about to talk about because it's time for my negativity to shine through. Next up for me is a game called Mission to Mars 2049, which could be distilled to be Latvian Space Catan. In Mission to Mars 2049, you are colonizing a, a circular board and you are racing to the center to establish a like a colony on the like the polar ice cap trying to create a uh, like a water station or something it doesn't really matter you are racing to the center whoever gets to the center first wins you do this by collecting resources um you have your initial settlement on the outside of the board and then you have three of the basic uh i don't know collection plants and you will roll the die And the die has symbols for each of those collection plants. They may earn you uh, fuel. They may earn you 
food, I think. There's, there's three different resources. You collect them. You will eventually turn them in to create new collection plants or new civilizations, new towns, for lack of a better word. You have a whole menu that you look at, and you can decide what you, uh, what you want to spend your resources on. There's also a robber. I don't think they call it a robber. Something that takes your resources against your will. Um, that's a, a danger. Uh, except there's not really a hand limit. There's not really a limit in how many of these resources you can hold in your hand. Um, you can translate them into discs, which are protected from opponents stealing them through the robber slash thief action. Um, but there's no real reason to do so. Anyway, you are collecting resources and building things and racing toward the center. But the whole thing feels like it's on rails. Because there's very little decision in where you build these new civilizations. They have to be built next to uh, one of your existing civs. Um, and you have to always build closer to the center because you only have five of these civilizations. And if you built one off kilter from moving toward the center of the board, you'd lose because you'd never reach the center. So you have to build toward the middle, um, eventually building a road that leads to the middle and then having the resources to build to the middle. Take everything that makes Catan Catan and then remove some of the most important parts. Like, you can't trade amongst players in this game. Um, there is a 4 to 1 trade ratio. You can build to get a 3 to 1 or maybe a 2 to 1 trade ratio. Um, but you can't trade with the other players. There are some negative effects. You can buy cards. You can buy cards that are either um, pleasant effects or uh, nasty effects. So uh, one can be you know, blowing up a, 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 a town or blowing up, stealing one of the collection uh, locations. The whole thing just felt clunky. And if you're going to make a game that is so similar to Catan and it pales in comparison to Catan, I don't see the point in owning it. And that's really what this is. There are a couple of interesting thematic things. They, the um, box says it's all based on actual scientific research, which I don't see. It also declares that it's very easy to teach because on the outside of the box, it says it takes five minutes mouth-to-mouth -to, -mouth to explain. And only 20 minutes if you're reading the rule book. Does it actually say the word mouth to mouth? It says five minutes mouth to mouth, 20 <laughs> minutes from the rule book. Eric, I'm pretty sure it's mouth to ear. <laughs> I, I can only go with what I saw. Um, Mission to Mars 2049, it, it just, it's not Catan, but it's so similar that you have to compare the two. And it, it just doesn't survive. So n this is a pass for me. See, the power of word of mouth is this, folks. I, I, this, I almost played this one the other night. I always take piles of games with me when I go somewhere. I almost pulled this one out because I thought Mars is interesting, even if I know there's some really cool Mars games coming out later this year. But now that Eric has given it a pass, and you all know how positive he is about games, this <laughs> one was now like, I'll still probably play it, but I am now no, in, in no hurry to. Hmm. Okay, but we're not going to stay negative here. If I am dragging Eric down, I will bring him back up. Eric, have you heard of this Escape the Room? I have heard about it. I'm anxious to play it. Do you have it? I don't. Okay, good, because I want to make you jealous a little. Oh. All right. So Escape the Room is a one-time event. It is basically an escape room in a box, but it's definitely yeah. geared so that younger folks can join in on it. The box says 10 and over, but I think with adult supervision, it could easily be 8 and over. My son is going to be all over this thing then. Yeah, I, I really think so. The box also says 3 to 8. I would think more realistic, it's 2 to 5. The reason I say that is because I think 8 is just too many. Would be I played it with 4, me, myself and my three oldest daughters. And I think a fifth person would have been fine, but I think more than that, it would have been too crowded. We were already kind of like getting in each other's ways because the way escape rooms work, there's lots of puzzles all over the room, right? And everyone's working on them. In this game, usually there's one puzzle at a time. 
So you can work on this puzzle together, but eight people I think would just be too many. But hmm. – so what this game is, is you are – there's a story and I'm not going to spoil the story or anything. But essentially you are trying to find the solution to puzzles. The box comes with an envelope and uh, and then a, a card that tells you how to start and you need to figure out what you need to do to open that – to open one of the envelopes, which might lead you to another envelope. And you keep going until you get one of four different endings. Hmm. Um, and so it gives you a time limit. If you're playing with less than five, it gives you two hours. Wow. Which we finished it in 50 minutes, maybe because Hmm. we're awesome like that. Yeah. My kids really got into it. We really had a good time. We liked the story. I probably could have solved 95% of it on my own. So it's not that hard. Although there was a very obvious thing in the beginning where I was like, I don't understand this at all. And my kid's like, well, what if you do this? And I was like, oh, glad you're Hmm. here. Nice. And and everybody had – I really tried not to quarterback, so I stayed back out of it as much as I could. And everybody had their moment to shine where they'd be like, oh, wait a minute. Remember this thing we found way back when? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it was really cool. It was a lot of fun. It's uh, very spatially oriented puzzles. Okay. Um, and observational puzzles. But I would say spatial is probably the most important thing you would need. Hmm. Some people will balk at this. The same people who complain about Pandemic Legacy, I guess. Hmm. Because it's a one-time thing, but I would say... It sort of it seems as, like, um, like, seems to, like how to host a murder. It does, it does. And you can get into that. I mean, we all wore hats, but of course, <laughs> that's not totally unusual. That's like required dress code for the Vassal household. Right, but I, I said we're all wear hats, and uh, let's see. I was the caretaker, and I was playing with Lady Cardinal, uh, Miss no Miss Cardinal, Lady Jane, and Maud. Nice. So <laughs> that is what we did, and we all got into it. We had fun, and it, there was one point where I solved one of the puzzles by myself because the kids were like, "Oh, we can't figure this out." I was like, "All right, I will now." Put 100% on this. And it took a bit, but I got it. Um, mm-hmm. But really enjoyable. I highly recommend it. I was super excited when I looked in a book and saw that there's a part two coming. Or not a part two, but you know, like another one. I, I, sequel, I would yeah. get them all. Because it was a great evening I spent with my kids. Okay. And so I, th- I think for adults, I wouldn't, I wouldn't probably play this particular one with adults. Too easy, probably. All right. But for a family setting... Very enjoyable. This is from Think Fun, by the way. Hmm. I'm going to have to put this on the wish list. Yeah, yeah. Really good. I'm super glad that I got it. Uh, you know, I mean, one of the reasons I game anyway is to have a uh, – to spend time with people. Spending time with my kids is amazing. To spend time with my kids where they're all enjoying the game does not always happen. Hmm. This is like a cooperative game, and I – anyway, super fun. That's Escape the Room. Cool. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Mr. 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 Uh, yes. Do you have any superpowers? Are you really working on nothing personal, Junior? What are your top ten candy bars? And now Tom, the dice tower will authoritatively, have... definitely, uh, possibly, possibly maybe, answer your questions. Uh, uh, t- Tom, uh, oh, which way to the bathroom? It's down the hall, to the left, go past three doors, down two flights of stairs. Beware of the cougar. Hmm. Oh, sorry, the leopard. Our first question, if it's a mountain lion, then... This could be a 24. Uh, our first question comes from Andre, and he says that he bought a card game, and after a while, it had nail marks from every time a player would grab it from the table. Mm-hmm. And I, I, I can't tell if he's saying that it's a player or if it's just when players would grab them off the table. Hmm. He said that it wasn't very good quality, but he didn't expect to have the game all marked so quickly. You know, since he said that, I'm going to assume it's a bad player. Sure. So he emailed the designer, and he simp- the designer suggested that he should sleeve the cards if he wanted them to last. He said he was outraged at this answer, but it reminded him when he played Magic the Gathering, where he used to sleeve cards. Now he finds himself sleeving every game that has cards. He even sleeved all of his 500 Thunderstone cards. And, you know, cards look plain, but you lose some of what makes a card awesome, such as a nice linen finish. So what makes us decide to sleeve our cards? When is it that you think it's better just to play the game until it's end and just forget about protecting it too much? Hmm. Now, I did not put this in here 
to talk about when we sleeve our cards because we've covered that to death. Sure. When the game has a few cards that are used over and over again, I sleeve those few cards. And I think Eric is similar to that. I, yeah, I actually don't sleeve very often. I'm of, of the opinion that you can play with the basic cards for a while, and then when they start to show wear, then sleeve them. Well, I, I, the other day, Eric, I, I got some game. I forget what game it was. It was a, a hit and roll game where it was like five or six cards that were hit and rolls. Yeah. And I was like, ah, we need – after playing it a couple times, I like, ah, I better sleeve these like right away. Right. But anywho – I, I want to talk about, like, is it the responsibility of the company here? He said he was outraged that the designer said that they should sleeve the cards. Mm. And I've been pricing out printing cards recently because we got the Dice Tower card money coming. Yeah. And when you get cards made, you can get them made on different kinds of paper, right? Um, different weights of paper. And then you can get the, the matte paper or not. Or the linen. I'm sorry, the linen right. finish. Linen finish. And there is linen finish that you can get on cards where you can barely tell it's there, but it does make the cards more durable. Hmm. That's a big deal, um, and, I, and I tested it because I nicked – I was like, well, I can barely tell the difference between these two cards. But when I nicked them with my fingernails, the linen ones were much more resistant to that than just regular base cards. Hmm. Um, the, but then you can get really nice linen cards. Think Ticket to Ride. I believe has really nice linen cards. A lot of games these days yeah. have linen cards. Those cards are more than double the cost. Wow. Of a regular set of cards. Hmm. That's really the truth of it. Linen cards are that much more expensive. So that will raise the price of a game. Anytime any piece in a game's price goes up, so does the cost of the whole game. Yeah. So just keep that in mind. So there's some there's some tricks around us. First of all, having white borders on your card helps a lot because little nicks are not nearly as noticeable when your borders of your cards are white. Um, and if the cards are going to be used a lot, I would consider getting a linen finish put on them. My Dominion cards are all beat up compared to other games that have nicer cards. I don't believe that Dominion cards are that spectacular, are they? Uh... I want to say no. they're regular. They're just normal cards. Real, Real Grande did not use linen finish. Actually, I, I still don't think they use linen finish because I know my Lost City cards are beat up. <laughs> um, and and the cards that don't have linen finish will eventually get nicks in them too. Sometimes part of the card will peel off or different things. So there's a lot going on there. But anyway, that's what I wanted to answer about this question. And I'm just curious – um, I thought maybe some people might be curious about that. Hmm. John says, as a game designer, I'm just as interested in games that do not work and are no fun as I am in games that work and are fun. I feel I can learn from both. On our show, we seem to like or enjoy the vast majority of the games we talk about. <laughs> Is this because you just tend to be positive people because you actually like most games that are out there or because you choose to talk mostly about just the good on your show? Um... Uh, yeah. As an aside, are there any games of note that you think have interesting mechanics but are boring to actually play? This is a good question. Um, I, I do think it's funny that he says we like the most games we talk about. I would imagine that John does not watch our video show. Yeah, probably. We, are, we do a lot of negative reviews. Now, granted... I would still say well over 50% of my reviews are positive because if 50% or more were negative, this would be a tough job. It, w it would be. Well, I think when it so comes to the stuff you talk about on the podcast, you're going to probably highlight the better games, the ones that are more interesting to talk about here on the show, unless it's really bad and then you want to highlight that. So we, we get like the whole gradient of good and then the really terrible things here on the show. Whereas you're reviewing maybe a wider swath in the video reviews. Well, right. In the video, we're doing everything that we come across. Uh, in the show itself, it all depends. I always pick games for the show, and I try not to repeat anything that we talk about in our opening game reviews. And sometimes I'm like, oh, wow. Okay, what have I reviewed lately? And I go through them, and I pick out not so much the ones I like as much as the ones I think are most interesting or that most people want to hear about. Mm-hmm. Like today, I had some games on the list 
and there was a game called Expo 1906. And then when I got that, that I, I played that Escape the Room, and it was so phenomenal. I want to talk about it. Right. Escape 1906. Even though I liked that better than Epic Roll, which I'm not going to say that name again. I'm going to call it ER. Okay. Um, even though I liked it better than ER, it it was bland. Okay. It was not very noticeable. It was kind of like eh. And I only talk about those eh games when for some reason that's we have a whole lot of them or something. And so some of them make the list. And Eric only talks about those when he has nothing else to talk about. I know that. <laughs> yeah, or, or if it was such an epic <laughs> failure that I really want to tell the story. Well, right. But there are some weeks. Now, this happens to Eric more than me because there's – I mean it's my job. So I play more games. Eric doesn't always have a chance to play as many games. So there's some weeks where I can tell he's stretching. Uh, yeah, you noticed, huh? <laughs> yeah. Be like, oh, I, I played this game with my kid uh, after bedtime because we had to get a game for the show. <laughs> uh, but then again, he says, um, are there games that have interesting mechanics but are boring to actually play? There's a lot of games like that, actually. Yeah. I'll be like, wow, that's a really fascinating thing. You get to put some cards together and they do a combo, but the game itself is boring. The problem is I can't think of a name of one of these off the top of my head. The one that I can think of most recently was um, that, that Victory Point Games, uh, the hospital co-op, Healthy Heart Hospital. Uh, it had some neat neat aspects with these cube draws, but you just had to do the cube draws so much that it, it bogged the whole thing down, and I, I ended up not being interested anymore. Hmm. Jonathan says, how to contact a publisher when they're avoiding their customers. And he talks about how he bought a game from a company, sent them emails, Facebook, posted them, tweeted them. There's people on BGG who also do not like this one. The distributor is not going to replace their box. Um, so is there a way that you could force them to acknowledge my complaint? As it's not fair, he bought an expansion, but he can't use it. He doesn't want to have to buy in sleeve cards, as he hates paying with sleeve cards. Yeah, he, so he bought an expansion for a game, and the two the sizes of the cards don't mesh. They're the wrong size cards. Some people are probably saying, I know what he's talking about, but you but you may not, because this has happened multiple times. Yeah. Um, and also it happened like uh, seven months ago or something. But anyhow. The reason I this question is here, it, it, this is a good one, is I would like to highly discourage people from thinking that we are a resource in this matter. <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, I, I don't mean that to be silly or, or even to be flippantly annoying to people, but someone will email me because I'm trying to get a hold of Fancy Flight and they want to answer my email. Can you email them on my behalf? Oh, oh okay. No, I, I can't. I'm not going to start emailing companies every time someone has a problem with them because I'm not their customer service. I don't work for them in a sense, and I might know a contact where I can get through, but that's not the proper channels. And if that reflects badly on them, that's one thing, but then I'll get caught up in the middle of things. Right. And I'm already kind of slammed with emails as it is, so we can't really do that. And even more importantly, I am not going to call out a publisher publicly, which I've been asked to do Almost on a monthly basis hmm. for something that's happened to you. There's just a lot of problems in here. That someone will say, this company did deliver their Kickstarter or this company did this and you need to say something publicly. And I understand the frustration, but we are not a gotcha news service. I want to be able to talk to publishers without them worrying that we're going to call them out publicly on air. I don't think it's a very sporting thing to do anyway. Uh, but when when we... There's no – you should never, ever publicly flog somebody for something which doesn't really affect you and is not critical to something. For example, if I knew somebody was exploiting women, that's something I can publicly call out because there are people's lives in danger. Mm -hmm. There are things happening that should not be happening. I, I don't know I'm if any of the gonna, board game publishers are doing that. No, but I'm saying I, I'm not applying this to every area of my life. Okay, there are sometimes you need to call things out. They're dangerous and wrong, and people need, you know. But a publisher not refunding you your money? Well, I don't know both sides of the story. I've only heard yours. There's no way I can call them out. A publisher doesn't deliver in a Kickstarter? 
we will actually mention that occasionally in a show, but we're not going to call them out on it as much as because, again, we don't know everything. And so we don't want to be a rallying point for people's discontent with different things. Hmm. You, you can say that stuff. You know, you say what you want. You know, hey, this company didn't deliver under promises, and maybe that will chase people away. But I can't pick up your cause for you, or I won't pick up your cause for you, I guess is the better way to do it. And it kind of sucks sometimes, you know, because you, it seems I, – I know what it's like to email a company and not have them email you back. That, that actually still happens to me, folks. Sometimes. It does seem like sometimes if you want a response, Twitter is a better way to uh, get an immediate response. Um, have, you know, say this particular component doesn't look right or it's, it's broken or something, and you'll often get an immediate response from some of these publishers that you may not be getting emails back from. But Jonathan tried that route. He did. He did. And that's fine. And I'm not saying he's, he's done anything wrong. And I'm, I'm not even defending the company he's talking about. I'm just saying that in these situations, I, I really don't know what your best course of action. If you tried all the different ways to contact them, I don't, I, I don't know what to tell you because I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit hesitant to say, Oh, well, you should just post online publicly and then people join you because that doesn't always seem the best way to accomplish things. Mm -hmm. <sighs> just don't buy any more games from them, I would guess. Like, yeah. That's unfortunate, but that's the way it is. Michael has noticed in your videos, Tom, that along the side of your room you have a white shelving unit that looks like it would be used for storing components or tokens and such for games. Michael's looking for a solution to house his miniatures and little tokens for games like Arcadia Quest or Small World without having to have a bunch of tackle boxes taking up space on my Kallax shelf. Is this what you use it for, and where would someone go to find something like this? That is partially what I use it for. I also use it for storing dice and meeples and cubes and just all sorts of extra pieces for games. I store my HeroScape stuff in those. Hmm. Uh I get those at the one of the top ten greatest stores in the world, the container store. Container store. store, yeah. If you're not near a container store, they do deliver. They do have an online store. I do not know if these particular units are available there or not. I don't know. If you do have a container store and you walk into it, it will be a while before you walk out. <laughs> if you are a gamer, mm -hmm. because you will sit there and think, "Wow, they have boxes that can go inside my games." They yeah. have games. They have boxes where my games can go inside them. They have all these ways to organize my games, and and other things too. Yeah. I, I just want to organize my entire house when I go there. I'm yeah. like, look at this. This is specially made for holding oranges. And my <laughs> wife, we we don't we don't need that. But then our oranges would look so nice. And now we know where the oranges go. It ah, uh, if I was unlimited money. I think my first stop would be container store, and I'd buy them out <laughs> and just go home, and my whole house would be filled with containers. There I'd you go. I'd put the kids in containers. You wouldn't even be able to open the door just full of no, containers. No, you would be able to open the door, and you would just see stacks of shelves and containers. I'd make the kids sleep in a rolled-up container in bed. <laughs> Pull them out. I, I wouldn't do that, folks. That was a joke. Right. Kevin says, do you find it's easy to fall asleep after regular game night? Mm. If not, are there any tricks in particular you find helpful? He doesn't suffer from insomnia, but he founds after a night of board gaming, my mind is so charged up that going straight to bed is usually pointless. How long does it take your brain to wind down after a night of gaming? Hmm. Mine is somewhere between 5 and 30 seconds. <laughs> the other guys make fun of me on this one because I fall asleep so fast. Yeah. Uh, but, I, I fortunately have a 30-minute, yeah, a 25-minute drive home from my regular game night, so it's sort of a moot point. By the time I get home, I'm ready to, to settle in. Um, but yeah, well, I don't really yeah, have, I a, do too. <laughs> have trouble. Uh, I don't really have trouble uh, uh, winding down after game night anyway. I just know I have to get up in the morning, so I go to bed. Right. The only thing that that will keep me up at night is like doubt and worry and depression and I mean things that are like, oh, I have this bill to pay tomorrow. Oh, right. this kid is sick. You know, things that are like, but like a game, 
I'm like, oh, that game's really, oh, that was a great game. I can't wait to, I'm out. Yeah. So I'm not the best person to ask there. It's true. I'm also not a person you want in your classroom. <laughs> Although I'm not as bad as the guy at the, uh, at the uh, uh, fantasy fight presentation. Did I tell you about that, Eric? Oh, that there was a guy that fell asleep. Uh, yeah, while well, they were doing like the history of the gaming industry. Yeah. Christian Pierce got, we're going to go through the history of gaming. And the guy snored loudly, and I thought, oh, he's just, you know, like he was doing a joke. Ha, ha, ha. You know, like that. And it wasn't joking. He fell asleep and then snored loudly. And then the guy, like, next to him finally hit him a little bit. And then he did it again. It was very, I don't know. I, I probably shouldn't get a kick out of stuff like that. But I know it could be me. It could be me. i probably fallen asleep on Eric before. <laughs> well, I did when we took you back to the airport, right? That, that is true, yes. Yeah, that happens every time. That's why my wife drives and not me, because it's okay if I fall asleep in the passenger seat. Right. It, it, it is much better than if you were in the other seat. It's very true. David would like to know, how much experience with the base game do you think it's necessary to really enjoy a legacy-style game? So if you're talking about Pandemic Legacy or Risk Legacy, how familiar should you be with Risk or Pandemic to enjoy the legacy version? I, I would say zero. I, I, I really think you don't need any experience because in Pandemic Legacy, for example, the game teaches you as you go. Right. It even tells you, uh, you know, you could play without the legacy aspect for a couple of rounds just to get the basic mechanisms down. And You risk. definitely don't have to do that, though. Yeah. Um, risk. risk, I can't imagine even needing that much knowledge of risk to uh, enjoy risk legacy yeah no i I, th I think you're fine there um yeah even if someone's like let's say eric who's probably played pandemic more than me and 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 we were in the same legacy game i wouldn't feel at any disadvantage there no because we're working together that's right we work together like Pandemic Legacy and Risk Legacy. Sure. David had another half of his question. He did have another half of his question. David said that his wife, who's not a gamer, occasionally condescends to play board games with me. I generally crush her at whatever competitive game we happen to play. Yeah, I know, my fault, not hers. So the other night I suggested Forbidden Island, which she enjoyed quite a bit more than our usual games. Do you think it's worth trying to get her to try Pandemic and then maybe working up to Pandemic Legacy? Well, if she liked Forbidden Island, then Pandemic is not too far away from that. Yeah, but again, you're not really working your way up to Pandemic Legacy. It's Without spoiling it, it's not – Pandemic Legacy changes a minor thing at a time, and it's, right. not, it's not overwhelming at all. Eric is it, playing with his kids. It starts out as Pandemic. You, you don't need to do Pandemic in between. It's, in fact, if she likes Forbidden Island, you could just go straight to Pandemic Legacy without really any sort of hiccup. Also, and very seriously, stop crushing her at competitive games. Let's go to the top ten. It's a Dice Tower Top Ten! The Dice Tower's Top Ten list is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, Inc. Cool Stuff, in stock at CoolStuffInc.com. Long Games. Oh, long games. Now, now, how long is long? Yeah, well, I see, I'm going to just put out this, stop it. I'm just saying this ahead of time. Because there's going to be someone out there who goes, that's not a long game. A long game is when you start it and you play it over the whole summer. We get it, okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. But the rest of us are married and have kids and can't do that sort of nonsense. So for me... What was your metric? I said three hours. That was where I was too. Three plus hours. And I know some people are like, three hours is not a long game, but it really is, okay? <laughs> it's a, it's a, for me, it's a long game, and many of my games are longer than three hours anyway. But mm. I predicted at the beginning that, there would, that the crossover would be very low. Yes. Let's see if my prediction is correct. Yeah. Number 10. Let's start things off with Age of Steam. This is my favorite of the Martin Wallace train... Uh, systems uh, and Age of Steam can last, but this is probably maybe the shortest shortest of the uh, of my selections here. 
And uh, it can take a little while in, in the planning of Age of Steam as you think about how many shares to take and uh, what routes you can possibly figure out. And uh, it, it's, worth the, it's worth the little bit of a grind that it can be. I really enjoy Age of Steam, my number 10. Yeah, I'm, I don't know that I consider that a very long game. But, okay. My number 10 can be long, and that is Dune. Or its re-implementation, Rex, although Rex was considerably shorter than Dune. Dune could easily go six hours. Hmm. Dune is a game that took place on the planet of Dune. There were six different factions who are fighting over the planet. Rex is the same thing, except they took it out of the Dune universe and put it in the on the planet Mechatol Rex in the Twilight Imperium universe. Uh, there's alliances and betrayal, and there's a lot going on. Every turn, you're like, who's going to work with who? Who's going to do what this turn? It's a pretty strong negotiation game. It probably works best. It's not probably. It definitely works best with six players. Of course, when you play a six-player grandiose epic game like that, it's going to take a long time. Although, oddly enough, Dune has a very variable game length. Uh, when people say, how long does it take? I'll be like, eh, about two to six hours. Well, mm-hmm. that's kind of a... Jumpy time frame there. Some of it's slightly dated. I don't play it as much anymore, which is why it's my number 10. But my number 10, Dune or Rex. Number 9. My number 9 is Firefly. Uh, This one can take quite a while. And there are ways to play it so that it it moves more quickly. There's lots of scenarios where you can play uh, a little bit faster. But if you're playing most of the basic scenarios, the epic scenarios, Firefly is going to take you a while to work your way through. But I think it's worth it. I think the adventure is fun, and it's it's neat to see the epic nature as you spread out all over the board and uh, and try and misbehave more efficiently than your opponents. Firefly is my number nine. My number nine is War of the Ring. Now, I I actually have said I like Battle of Five Armies, but Battle of Five Armies is not a long game compared to War of the Ring. War of the Ring is just kind of squeaking in there. Doesn't usually take much longer than three hours, but does take that and feels very epic. I actually thought about calling this game, this list, Epic Games, but then I knew everybody would argue over what epic meant when I just Mm -hmm. meant long. And also, I didn't want people being, oh, tiny epic kingdoms. Yeah, huh? Uh, Which, by the way, Eric, I don't know if you noticed, they are now kickstarting a pocket version of Tiny Epic Kingdoms. What, what? It's Ultra Tiny Epic Kingdoms is what it's called. Okay. Save us from ourselves. Anyhow, War of the Ring, though, is Lord of the Rings in a box. That's how I've always said it is. It really is. The Fellowship's trying to throw the ring in. Meanwhile, there's massive battles happening all over the place. It's huge. It's fun. It's long. It's War of the Ring, my number nine. Number eight. My number eight is Zaya. If you're playing to the full victory point count, 20 victory points, this one can take a while. You are uh, upgrading your ship and exploring various routes, and it takes a while just to find the whole map. Uh, this one's, this one's a, a significant investment in time if you're playing the full 20 points, but it's worth it. I, I love it. Zaya, my number eight. Yeah, I didn't put this because I never played it at full victory points. So Yeah, it's easy to switch it to just like 12. Number eight is another one that squeaks in there, and that's Forbidden Stars. Forbidden Stars is actually... Shorter if you play with only two, but if you play the full complement of four players, it's going to be a lengthy game. There's a lot going on as you play in the Warhammer 40,000 universe with the Eldar and the Orcs and the Chaos and the Space Marines fighting back and forth. It's a cool space epic style game, but it can take around three to four hours. That's why it's on my list. Number eight, Forbidden Stars. Number seven. Terra Mystica is my number seven. Uh, it almost takes a little while just to figure out how to play your race uh, as you, you've acquired a new one each time you play. Um, and uh, it's you play, what is it, six rounds, I think? Uh, and then, yeah, it's maybe about 20, 30 minutes per round. So that's that's going to add up. And uh, again, it's it's... A crunchy game, figuring how to how to uh, use the strengths and weaknesses of your particular faction to your advantage, and that's part of the fun in in trying to work your way through Terra Mystica. My number seven. Yeah, uh, this one. Spoiler alert: did not make my list. Yeah. All right, number okay. seven for me is actually a crossover. What? 
We'll get to that in a different era. Number six. My number six, I know Tom didn't put on his list either. That's going to be Indonesia. Well, I, I this actually is the... I haven't played it. You haven't played Indonesia? Okay. I haven't played um, pretty much splatter... any, any splatter game except Bus, and that was a bad experience, so I'm done. Okay, it's just sworn you off all of them? No, I'm going to uh, play fast food franchise at some point. Okay. Uh, Indonesia is uh, the game is set in Indonesia, the various islands, and you are uh, increasing your empire of of uh, you know various crops, and they expand each turn, and then you're merging companies and shipping companies in order to earn more money than your opponents. Uh, there's a lot of math involved, uh, but it's, again, worth it. I say it, it's worth it, again, a lot. Uh, I love all of the machinations that make this whole thing work. Um, there's a lot of moving pieces in Indonesia, and it's a lot of fun. My number six. My number six is Demacher, hmm. which is a Euro game, and you wouldn't expect the Euro game to be on this list. By the way, we know, again, of course, that there are many war games that go forever and ever, amen, and they can yes. they can stay that way. But Demacher is a game that you can reasonably expect it to take four hours. It's a game about the German elections. There is a lot going on. You are changing your positions <laughs> to match what the people want, or you're trying to influence the people to have the positions that you want them to have that match your party. Making coalitions with other parties, trying to win different regions. It's a very intriguing game, which, oddly enough, still really holds up today. Most most games kind of, you know, they start being dated. Demacher doesn't necessarily feel that way, other than its length, which is why it's on this list at number six. I still have yet to play Demacher. I really... That's one of those bucket list games I need to try. Maybe we'll do that at Dice Tower Con. Maybe. Number five. Eclipse is my number five. And it's it's easy with Eclipse, especially if you've been playing uh, with the app or playing with smaller player counts, to, to think it moves at a pretty good clip. But if you play with the full six players or, uh, or even if you're just totally nuts and, and do the double set with multiple, like, nine shit, it's going to take a while. Um, and... Uh, You've got a lot of interaction with the players. Anytime you have a battle, you have to resolve it with the various back and forth. And uh, it's going to take some time. Uh, but that epic nature of how do the different civilizations build their ships and uh, what do you focus on? Do you make a little pew, a bunch of little pew-pew ships that are going to shoot quickly and, and then get blown up? Or do you make giant destroyers that can absorb tons of damage? It's a blast. Eclipse, my number five. My number five is... Eldritch Horror, which again, I feel like it kind of squeaks on the list because th it can be three hours, but mm. it does feel those full three hours. And if you play the more well, too many players, you can go four hours. Eldritch Horror, I would have put Arkham Horror on this list years ago, but Eldritch Horror has kind of replaced Arkham Horror for me. Just a game of gallivanting around the world, fighting Cthulhu and his many minions, of which he seems to have so very many scary ones. And finding clues and going to the Arctic and everything else. That's Eldritch Horror. Number four. My number four showed up as number seven on Tom's list. And that's Through the Ages. Uh, the Civ game that does take some time to work your way through. But it's so rewarding uh, upgrading your stuff. I'm, I'm in the middle of another game. Uh, Jeff Engelstein won our first game of the, uh, the new Through the Ages. And we've re-upped. And hopefully I'll do better. I came in third. So uh, anyway, I, I I really love this game. Um, how do you make this civilization? How do you keep your civilization running while still figuring out how to earn points faster than your opponents and not get run over by their military? Really fun times, but it's it's a significant investment in time. Through the ages, number four. Excellent game. I agree with what Eric said. It's phenomenal how much this feels like a civilization game. Certainly an epic one. My number four is a new game on the list. In fact, it's it might be out by now in stores. But I don't know. It's coming out very soon. And that's Star Wars Rebellion. Actually, I believe it was suppo it's supposed to be released March 30th or 31st. So maybe it's not out yet. But anyhow, it will soon be out. And you'll be able to play episodes four, five, and six of Star Wars all together on this board with miniatures and Death Stars and Imperial Destroyers and capturing Chewie and Leia and Han and Lando and shooting. and Oh, it's exciting. It's fun. It's about three hours mm. long. 
That's Star Wars Rebellion. Number three. Number three, Tom mentioned just a few minutes ago, and that's Food Chain Magnate. This is the other splatter game that has surpassed all of their others in my estimation. So I noticed, um, since you're not mentioning it here, Roads and Boat didn't make your, make your list here. Roads and Boats didn't. Um, it. I've only played it once, for one thing, and while I enjoyed it, it, it has so many moving pieces, I think it, it got a little bogged down. Um, but that could have just been my first play. It hasn't, I haven't played it enough to really fit it into all of these others, which I've played more often. In Food Chain Magnate, you're running a food business. Um, I love all of the different paths you can take to victory. Uh, I love how each time you set it up, you have to react differently to what your opponents are doing, what the board situation is. Uh, it is a pretty good uh, investment in time. In fact, um, I'd learned at ConCon that if you are trying to teach this game to um, anyone who happens to be inebriated, it's going to take a little longer. Um, but you'll get there eventually. Food Chain Magnate, my number three. My number three is the longest game on my list, I believe, and that is Seven Ages, which is a game that is about going through Seven Ages, a civilization game where you start with several civilizations. You know, there's this deck of cards, and you get some random civilizations, and you start with depend the number you have depends on the number of players. The fewer players, the more civilizations you control. Sometimes those civilizations will crumble, or they'll be so worthless you'll be like, forget them. Think of this as the super heavy gamer's version of Small World. <laughs> yes, the combat is probably too clunky and long. Yes, there are many, many tiny little counters in the game. Yes, it takes a while to play, but it's still an amazing experience, so I had to put it on my list, although I would say this one is easily two and a half hours per player. <laughs> mm. That's Wow. That's seven ages. Number two. Number two is Power Grid. Uh, seeing this whole board develop as you start out with those initial power plant placements, those initial city placements, and then the way everybody spreads out, blocks each other, uh, the, the, the fighting in the power plant market for which new technology you want to get and you really want it more than your opponents, this far more efficient plant is, is what's going to really sustain me for the next several rounds. Um, and then the, that rush to the end game to see who triggers it. It's, it's an arc, and it's, it's one that uh, takes some time to develop, but it's pretty neat getting there. Power Grid, my number two. Yeah, um, I, I don't think this is a long game for me, but then again, you also put this on your six-player list. so I did, and um, I think I usually play it at the five- or six-player count. And that would explain the correlation. All right. Now, my number two is – I was talking to Sam and Z about this because I was like, man, I could put all the legacy games on here because yeah. technically Pandemic Legacy takes, what, 20 hours, hours or so? Yeah. And and Time Stories, each game of Time Stories takes five to six hours. And that's true, but I didn't want to clog up the list with those. So I put just one, and that's actually Descent Second Edition, which is – uh, each game is probably one and a half to two hours each each part of the thing, but you can keep playing and playing and playing and playing, mm -hmm. and you never have to stop, and the whole game is probably 30 to 40 hours. So I wanted to nod to these types of games. They are certainly long games. You certainly can come in and say, hey, we're going to play Time Stories today. That's our game. We're going to take all mm -hmm. day and play straight through it. I've seen people do it. I taught it in uh, three in, in sorry four hours at ConCon. The whole game. We did the whole asylum scenario. I'm surprised you stayed. You didn't just teach and walk away. No, I wanted to make sure. I wanted to guide them through the puzzles. When the, they got there were to a the, couple of the really hard part. Yeah, I, I I felt like a little bit of guidance was necessary in the in the latter part of the game. I would have let them suffer. Yeah, well. All right, but anyhow, so these games, I think, certainly qualify for long games, but I know there will probably be some people who argue about this one, but I'm putting Descent 2nd Edition because I don't know that I've ever just got Descent 2nd Edition out for uh, two hours. Almost every time I played it, we played three or four scenarios in a row, which turns into five, six, seven hours. 
So that's the cent second edition. Mm-hmm. And finally, number one. And number one. Lame. Yeah. You knew it was coming. Hey, no, I actually you know, you didn't put... know this would be on this list. Really? Well, it's like two and a half hours, right? Uh, so depending on the players, this can last pretty long. Oh, we're talking about Merchants of Venus, by the way. If you're going with like really experienced players, you can get under the three hour mark. Also, if you're playing the new Fantasy Flight rules, this is well over the three-hour limit. So, depending on which version you're looking at, it, it definitely fits fits the category. Um, but if you're playing the the classic rules, the the stand or the yeah the classic rules, and playing with at least four or even five or six players, yeah, it's going to last a long time. And and also, if players get a little bogged down uh, in their movement and um, slow things down a little bit. Yeah, it can it can certainly last a little longer. Obviously, I think that's worth it. Um, it, it. This is another one that you need to see that that board develop, the roots develop, and it takes time to to build that, build up your ships. Also, if people are buying more ships, um, that slows things down a little bit because it takes a while to earn your money back. Merchant of Venus, my number one, as expected. All right. Well, my number one is Twilight Imperium 3. This isn't just a nod to Mr. Healy, who does like this Mm. game so very much. But Twilight Imperium takes about six to eight hours to play. I think it certainly qualifies Mm. for long game. And yet when I play it, I'm not bored. I'm fascinated. I'm interested the whole time. Every game is played differently. There are technologies. There are units. There are battles. There's politics. There's Euro game mechanisms. It's all in that box. It's pretty cool. And we're going to be playing this one live at some point this year on the Dice Tower. With with I, I just found out today we might be playing with a painted set of it, which is kind of crazy. Ooh, cool. So my number one, no surprise to anybody, Twilight Imperium 3. This is another bucket list game for me. You have so many bucket list games. I do. Let's see what the contributors say. Hey, Broken Meeple here. What do you class as long? Two hours? Three hours? Six hours? There's too many games to note that I enjoy that take a while. So I'm going to pick my first one. The first one that I recall that was a long game for me, which is three hours or more, I'd say is pretty long, that got me interested in more lengthier games, and that was Sid Meier's Civilization, the board game. Tactical decisions, great strategy, plays great homage to the fantastic PC series. It's a classic for me. Hello, hello, Ignacio. Check, Portal Games. And this is Steven Bonacore from Stronghold Games. We are Board Games Insider. Yes, and I don't play too many long games, but the game I like and I love is the Twilight Struggle. It's a great strategy game that takes about two hours to play for two players' game. Amazing stuff. And I'm going to go with another Twilight game Twilight Imperium 3rd Edition brilliant game. I know people say, ah, it's too long, it's too long for the payoff. No, no, no. Love it. Play it with four players and you can get through it in three and four hours. It's an awesome game. This is Brian from Cult of the Old. I'm going to have to go with Classic Civ. Not just because it's old. It stood the test of time. Now, to be fair, I haven't played Through the Ages yet, and the last time I played an eight-plus-hour game of Twilight Imperium 3, which is second on this list to me, I won. So I never need to play that thing again. Hey, this is Graham from the Four Corners of the Board. For our play group, a long game is anything over two and a half hours. And I know by some standards that is not considered long, and I'm looking at you, TI3 players. But for us, with limited game time, devoting that much time to a game is a rarity. It just so happens the games near the top of my personal favorites are longer than two and a half hours. Dominant Species, Roads and Boats, and Food Chain Magnet. Now, it's a tough call, but I'll have to go with Food Chain Magnet. No, wait. uh, Dominant Species. Hmm. Nope. Nope, sticking with Food Chain Magnet. This is Trent Howell with the Board Game Family, and my favorite long game is Power Grid. It may not be as long as what others consider long, but coming in over two hours is long in my book, and I love it. What I love most is that I'm totally mentally engaged the entire time. Whether it be the plant auctions, fluctuating resource cost, burning resources, area control, or turn order position, I'm constantly evaluating options. And I hardly notice hours have passed. Power grid all the way. Tony and Marty, rolling dice and taking aim. My favorite long game has got to be StarCraft, the board game. I love that it brings back the memories of having played the video game for so many years. And also just the placing of the orders, being able to block someone, reliving a zergling rush on the board game just like you did in the video game. 
Marty? When I play a long game, I want to play a game with an epic experience. And for me, that game is the Game of Thrones board game. Has a lot of great mechanics, a lot of great decisions to be made during the game, but has that uh, little bit of a stab your buddy in the back thing, too, that makes for a fun three to four hour game. Hey, this is Paul Owen of Dice Tower News. By far, my favorite long game is Age of Renaissance, a 1996 Avalon Hill release that I consider to be a refinement of the old Civilization game. The theme is strong, the tension is perpetual, and economics dominate the gameplay. As we like to say in my group, it's not a war game, even though some of us try to play it that way. Best long game, Age of Renaissance. This is Ryan from Out of Game, and to me, the best long game that I've ever played is still the 1981 version of Axis and Allies. I spent hours and hours and hours playing this game in college, and I don't regret a single second of it. Meng here from Father Geek. Although I've not played the game for more than 20 years, Francis Tresham's Civilization remains top of my list of games to play if I ever get to devote an entire day to a single game. Gamers have been keen to find other games offering a similar experience in a shorter playing time, the so-called Civ Light game, but none in my opinion have come close to achieving this ultimate challenge of game design. You know those rainy Sunday days when the housework has already been done on Saturday and there's nothing for you to do? Well, do you know what old Barry Dublin does on days like that? He gets out a big old monster from another dimension and looks him squarely in the eye and says, Come on, pal. Give me your best shot. I can take it. Yes, my favourite long game, either played on my own or with the family, is Arkham Horror. <laughs> hey everyone, it's Mark Zelensky, and my favourite long game will come as no surprise to anyone. It's Advanced Squad Leader by Multi-Man Publishing. Yes, the Ultimate World War II Tactical Combat Simulator is an awesome game, but sometimes you can run into five, six, seven, even eight hours in some of the monster scenarios. But boy, is it a lot of fun. So wait, is there somebody snoring in the background while Mark talks about ASL? Okay. Because I could swear someone had fallen asleep while he was talking about ASL. Well, first of all, I want to be very clear that it wasn't me. Okay. Being silly and snoring in the background. But I would. <laughs> hey, he's allowed to pick it just as I'm allowed to pick my favorite. Yeah, well, his is actually long. That's true. But anyhow, um, okay, great. Let's see what the people's choice was. Number 10, Arkham Horror. Uh, number 9, War of the Ring. Number 8, Mage Knight the Board Game. That can go pretty long. Yeah, oh, it can. 7, Eldritch Horror. Six, Through the Ages. Mm -hmm. Five, Eclipse. Four, Battlestar Galactica. I was very close to putting that on my list. This one's kind of tricky for me. Is I like Battlestar Galactica when it's not long. Yeah. Right? I want it to be shorter than not. Hmm. Number three, Power Grid. Hmm. So I guess people agree with Eric there. Two, Twilight Struggle. I don't know. I th I, thought I played a lot of two and a half hour games of Twilight Struggle. That's why I didn't pick it. I like the game a lot. And number one, Twilight Imperium three. I believe, sir, the list is mine. Oh today. sure. All right. Well, anyhow, those are our long games. It is interesting. Someday we'll have to talk about why don't we have as much time as we used to, but we certainly don't have time to talk about that today. <laughs> That's irony in a podcast. What? All right. Well, you know what? Eric, let's finish this sucker up. Let's do that. Folks, until next time, I'm Tom Vassell. I'm Eric Summerer. And we are the abrupt enders of the Dice Tower Podcast. Thanks for listening. Promotional consideration has been provided by game publishers in the form of review copies of games. This episode, number 451, was recorded on March 25th, 2016. Coming up next week, what game suffers the most from power creep? find out what our contributors have to say support for this podcast comes from listeners like you thank you for your continued support and speaking of support the jack vassal memorial fund is dedicated to providing support to members of the board gaming community in their hour of need find out how you can help at jackvassal.org 
The Dice Tower is produced by Tom and me with production assistance from Jason Thompson, Itai Perez, Eric Matthews, and Rob Searing. Our theme was composed by Timothy Pinkham. Acrobatic party games for heroic fantasy explorers provided by Dungeon Twister. And hosting is provided by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games at great prices at CoolStuffInc.com. We love feedback. Visit the Dice Tower Guild at BoardGameGeek.com, email us at TheDiceTower at gmail.com, or follow us on Facebook. And, of course, you can find more from the Dice Tower Network, including the Out of Game Podcast, 20 Minutes of Filler, the Push Your Luck Podcast, the D6 Generation, the Geek All-Stars, Blue Peg, Pink Peg, and Dice Tower Showdown at Dicetowernetwork.com. Until next time, from all the gang at the Dice Tower, have fun gaming. Wouldn't it be weird if our episode here about long games was our longest episode ever? That would be weird. But I don't think that's possible because the Spiel guys aren't on it. <laughs> or the Secret Kabbalist either. Yeah, them too. Or D6 Generation. You know what? We're just short. Yeah.